Who here in this room is a veteran? Oh, excellent. Keep those hands up. Thank you for your service. Now keep those hands up, only for a little bit longer. Now everybody else, who here knows a veteran? I want you to take just a quick moment to look around. Almost everybody in this room has their hands up. And that is part of why this project is so important and so amazing. The mission of the Veterans History Project is to collect, preserve, and make accessible the firsthand remembrances of our nation's veterans. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about our history. And the reason I'm gonna do that is because I'm really, really excited about the fact that we're coming up to our 20th anniversary. So the Veterans History Project started October 27th, the year 2000. We're gonna time travel really quickly. I'm gonna take you back to that year. And uh, I'm gonna introduce you to Representative Ron Kind of Wisconsin. Representative Ron Kind was enjoying a Father's Day, you know, barbecue, just hanging out, watching his two kids play, when all of a sudden he had noticed that his father, World War II veteran, and his uncle, a Korean era veteran, started swapping stories. And they were sharing things that even though he had grown up with them, he had never heard that before. Recognizing the importance of that moment, Ron Kind ran inside, got that ubiquitous giant camcorder we all remember from the year 2000, and started recording. And it wasn't just for him that he was recording, but rather it was for his two sons, because he recognized there was absolutely no way they were gonna understand the importance of what was going on at that moment. So remember, I said Father's Day? October 27th wasn't too far away. Uh, by October 27th, we were unanimously uh, bipartisan passed into legislation to have Veterans History Project with an effort to have people in their communities to reach out to the veterans in their lives. So, looking up at the screen, you can see we have a bit of a variety as far as our veteran stories go. Veterans History Project consists of stories from every state every district. They range from World War I up through current conflicts. Looking up at the screen, you can see we have Starcross Lovers. That's Tracy Sugarman. His collection includes some of the best love letters I've ever read in my entire life. Below him with the red background is actually a chaplain who at one point had questioned his faith. We have the Navajo Code Talkers, and yes, we do have the uh, Medal of Honor recipients, but that's not necessarily what we're after. What we're looking for is those personal connection stories. We are looking from the ground up, from the foxhole, from the cockpit. We wanna know what you saw, felt, remembered. One of my favorite questions is about food. Who doesn't love food, right? Um, I feel like food is something that's completely relatable to somebody. Everybody has a story about what food was like in the service. So once again, our collection spans from World War I up through current conflicts, and as we are coming up to our 20th anniversary, we are very happy to announce the fact that we have 110,000 different collections. I saw somebody say, wow, thank you. Um, while we're very happy with that number, we also are very aware of another number, 18 million. There are 18 million veterans in our country today, and we only have 110,000 stories. But guess what? That's where you come in. So we need your help to help us complete this, uh, this national archive. I don't know if anybody has heard, but there is a Native American proverb that talks about it takes a million voices to tell a single story. And that's absolutely what Veterans History Project is about. So one of the things I like to say is there are a number of different ways that people choose to share their story. And luckily, uh, the folks who had started Veterans History Project eventually came to that realization as well. Some people are very comfortable talking on camera, talking um, and sharing an oral history. Some people, not so much. Some people would prefer to write it down. So what we have in front of you are our collection minimum requirements. So in order to establish a collection with Vet Veterans History Project, you could do one of three things. Number one, you could conduct an oral history with the veteran in your life. 
We do ask that the oral histories be a minimum of 30 minutes. Anybody who says, oh my gosh, that's so long, don't worry, we'll help you with the questions. And we've designed them in a way to make sure that you can get to that 30 minute mark. The other way you could establish a collection is through 20 pages or more of unpublished memoir, journals, or diaries. That 10? That's 10 or more original photographs, pieces of two-dimensional artwork, which are some of my favorites in the collection, or letters. Once you qualify on one of those three, that collection is considered an open collection, which means the minimums no longer are required. So you could have a 30-minute, 32-minute oral history and one photograph. That's great. We love that. Or you could have 10 letters and only a 15-minute oral history. Any opportunity you have to help make that collection that much more rich and provide us that much more information, we absolutely adore, and so do the researchers that use our collections. So, Veterans History Project is designed in a way that it could be used by members of Congress. They could set it up in their district and start interviewing the veterans within their lives. Or perhaps it's a school. We ask that students 10th grade or older are the ones who had participated as far as an outreach method. Or maybe it's just an individual wanting to know how they could interview their loved one. Well, there are a number of different ways that you can participate. Um, and in that slide, we actually have a picture of not only our brochure, but also our field kit. We have a couple of our field kits down at our table, which is down in Hall B in the Jefferson Building. And um, those field kits actually take you step by step as to how somebody could complete a veterans history project. They also have the draft questions in there, so they're kind of important. Um, another thing that's kind of neat that we do a with a lot of different uh, school groups, libraries, again, those members of Congress, and organizations that have a group of 25 people or more, if you have those 25 people or more, you can email us and say that you're interested in hosting a workshop. We are looking for 25 people or more to go out there and to conduct those interviews for us. And we will send a trained oral historian from the Oral History Association or the American Folklife Society to you at no cost to you. We just want to be able to give you those tools so that you can collect these resources. Anybody catch that I said the word original? Did you guys go to sleep on me? All right, just checking. Um, if anybody caught the fact that I had used the word original, yes, we do ask for original content, but there is a good reason. The Library of Congress has a humidity-controlled and climate-controlled uh, environment in which we hold all of our collections. This is a particularly interesting story. If you're taking a look at the screen right now, you may see Albert John Carpenter, who was a 19-year-old college student when he went over to France to participate in the Great War. Now, uh, Carpenter kept a pocket diary. I purposely kept my cell phone in my pocket so I could show you the size of his diary. It's about the size of our cell phones today. His diary starts October, the most eventful month of my life. And he goes on. He talks about the artillery. He talks about the mudding. He talks about the gassing. He talks about everything that we know the Great War to be about. And he comes home with his diary, and he passes it down to his son. And one day, his son's uh, wife, Shirley Carpenter, she says to the family that they're doing it a disservice. It's all loose leaf. It's got some tears. It's got some significant water damage, honestly, mostly just from the elements. So uh, we were the lucky repository who had received this collection. And one of the things that we were able to do was we were able to take it to our preservation and conservation lab. The tears, we were able to repair those with Japanese tissue paper. The parts that nobody could see because it was uh, all of that perspiration was on it, we were able to put a chemical on it and put it under ultraviolet light. So for the first time, the family was able to read what was supposed to be on that page. Again, it was housed in a humidity-controlled and climate-controlled environment, and we're very, very glad that it was. And we're very, very, very glad that Shirley Carpenter had the foresight to do that. Because as you can see from the slide, Hurricane Katrina paid her home a little bit of a visit. All of her precious belongings were under five and a half feet of water. 
this diary and the story of Albert John Carpenter would have been lost forever. It's just a picture to show you what it really looked like. So you can really see that you can, uh, for the first time, really understand what was supposed to be written on that. So one of the things we hear all the time, in fact, when I was over at the table this morning, I must have heard it 10, 15 times from veterans who had stopped by, I don't really have a story to tell. So my veterans out there, does anybody feel like that? Oh, I didn't do much. I don't have a story to tell. I don't think I'll meet that 30-minute requirement. Well, I, I'd like to argue you on that. I feel like everyone out there has a story to tell. The director of our project, uh, she said she didn't think she would reach that 30-minute minimum. Two and a half hours later, we learned she had a little bit more to say than what she thought. At this point, I'm going to introduce you to Heather Sandler. Heather Sandler came from a long line of uh, family members who had participated in the military. So she wanted to be like them. But instead of Air Force, she chose the Navy. Heather Sandler had served um, for 10 years with the United States Navy, and her job was essentially loading missiles and bombs on F-18s. After her time in the military, Heather started to work at the VA. And somebody there, a volunteer, asked Heather, would you be willing to sit down with me and share your oral history? Heather said the same thing. I, I, I didn't do much. I don't have much to talk about. But just like Representative Ron Kind, Heather had a family. And she knew that her two sons had only seen her dress up in uniform once for Veterans Day. So maybe she would do this. Maybe she would participate just for them. And as you can see from the quote, although she barely wanted to talk about her service to her husband and family, never mind putting it out there for the entire world to view on the web, my interview was one of the most cathartic experiences I have ever had and I no longer hide the fact that I'm a veteran. At this point, we're very excited. If anybody caught the date, the fact that we are uh, celebrating our 20th anniversary, which happens to be the 20th anniversary of the National Book Festival next year, so we will see you all back there next year. Uh, Veterans History Project is doing a number of different really exciting things surrounding the 20th anniversary. Um, our goal is to show to people that we have not just an opportunity to connect with the veterans in your life, but we also have 110,000 different stories of individuals who had participated. So you can use that archive as a resource. So. The first thing that we're doing is we are talking a little bit about the uh, November Art Showcase. So I would invite all of you to check out our Facebook as well as our RSS and look at some of the really interesting things we're doing for that November Art Showcase. After that, we have a really unique opportunity. Harvey and Gina Pratt, who had worked on the uh, National Museum of the American Indian Monument, they're going to come out and talk a little bit about their inspiration. Um, let's see, we're looking to do a music and the arts panel, and then in May, does anybody, was anybody here uh, about five years ago, oh, thank you, <laughs> about five years ago when we had that flyover, mass flyover of World War II aircraft? Well, we're doing it again, and what's really exciting is, while it was really, really great to see all of these historic aircraft flying, we're going to be able to connect personal stories to each of those aircraft through Veterans History Project. After that, uh, we do have a really neat education panel. Educators are some of my favorites. They always seem to come up with really creative ways to use the collection. Not only is this a really great resource for teachers to help teach students about active listening and for them to take the little bit that comes out in their history book but to really make it alive, but some of them, sometimes teachers, again, can be very, very creative. And what I have noticed from one teacher in particular is he has taken the oral history component and given that to the communications division. He then takes the audio of that and gives it to the art department. And the art department creates a piece which is then given to the veteran. It's just amazing. So we'll have some really great faculty who will come out and talk a little bit more about that. And then in November, of course, we'll have our large uh, 20th anniversary showcase followed by a monument walk. Just like what we're doing with the Arsenal of Democracy flyover where we're connecting veterans to the specific aircraft, 
We are also going to be connecting the monuments that we see here in DC on a regular basis and putting personal stories to each and every one of those. Again, the November Art Showcase. Now, one thing I was remiss about mentioning that I think is really, really neat. We have uh, poets, we have writers, we have a number of really great artists, potters who are coming out, fiddle player. Um, but we didn't want to forget about our friends in the culinary world. Remember I had mentioned about the food? Everyone has a story surrounding food. So what we are doing is we have identified a couple different restaurants who are owned by veterans. We're asking them to search within our collection for something that inspires them. And from that, they can create a new menu piece based off that veteran. The next step to that is that they can participate in Veterans History Project, establishing a collection. And then we'll ask them to talk about the full experience on our blog. Little teaser for that arsenal of democracy. You can see we have the Aviator Logbook, which is, again, going to be tied to the specific veterans and the specific aircraft. Do you think we could play that video? It didn't show up. If not, I'll just keep talking. Is anybody tired of hearing me talk yet? No? What I was hoping for was I could condense everything I've talked about in the past 20 minutes or so into about 30 seconds. We'll see if it works. So while he For two decades, the Library of Congress Veterans History Project has had a mission to collect the stories and original materials of U.S. veterans. If you would like to contribute to this ongoing nationwide effort, visit www.loc.gov forward slash vets, the Veterans History Project, because their stories are our stories. Thank you. That was just a little sneak peek of what our PSA for uh, 2020 is going to be. And the tagline is because their stories are our stories. And again, although we have 110,000 stories, every one of those stories adds to this unique tapestry that makes up our national history. So um, one of the questions we get a lot is, well, I've already participated. I've already done a little bit of this. I've already done a little bit of that. Anything you can add to that collection to make it that much more rich is always appreciated. So at this point, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, well, what happens with the collections that are you know, created and then submitted over to the Veterans History Project? Does anybody have any ideas? Okay. Um, well, they're used on a regular basis. In fact, that first image that you see actually features the reading room that we use. The Veterans History Project is part of the American Folklife Center reading room, and we serve collections to researchers, documentarians, students, just anybody who has a general interest um, on a weekly basis. The resources available on our website, which is loc.gov backslash vets, they're used every single day, but there's something that's really, really important about all of that. When you're filling out the information in the field kit, there comes to a release form. And about the second or third paragraph on that release form talks about copyright. I think the last presentation we just gave was about copyright, so it's kind of fun that I get to follow up with this. One of the things that Veterans History Project maintains is the fact that the veteran and the next of kin maintain that copyright. So if somebody wants to use that collection, and we've worked with Ken Burns on the war and the Vietnam, and we have over 600 different publications that cite Veterans History Project right now. If they want to use it, they've got to go through you. One more really quick story about how the collections have been used. Has anybody read the book Code Girls? Nobody, one, two, okay, cool, excellent. So you're familiar with Liza Mundy. 
So during World War II, a lot of the men were being shipped out, and we were needing people to break code. So what happened was they turned to our universities, and they identified women who showed an affinity to math and science. And these women received this little secret message asking two simple questions. Are you good at puzzles? And are you engaged to be married? If they answered correctly, they could have been chosen for part of this top secret code breaking mechanism. These women were supposed to tell people that they were secretaries, and many of them did. Many of them kept their secret for their whole life. Some of them started to share here and there. Um, because of Liza Mundy, she's been able to unearth these hidden figures because of this lovely book, Code Girls. And um, about a year after her book came out, we said, how come we've never had a Code Girls reunion? Right? So a couple months ago, we had the first ever Code Girls reunion. We had five of the original Code Girls come out and share their experiences. We also had a number of different family members who had come out. Anybody know Bill Nye the Science Guy? His mom was a Code Girl. I guess uh, we can say he got the science from his mom, right? What's really neat is when Bill Nye shares about his mom, she kept the secret for as long as she could it wasn't until they were sitting around the kitchen table and somebody had said something about breaking code during World War II that she finally lost it and spilled the beans. Uh, we also have a docent at the library whose mother was a code girl. And she didn't want to tell people that she was a secretary. So she chose another, uh, another fib, if you will. She told everyone she was a showgirl instead. I guess it got uh, no questions <laughs> after you say you're a showgirl. People leave that alone. Um, but those are just a couple ways that the collections that you can help create will be used. You can see that middle picture shows it's not just what I had talked about right now, but occasionally we have an opportunity in the library and over at the Capitol Visitor Center to share about collections. Um, there was a gentleman by the name of William Barner excuse me, William Barnes. And William Barnes was a doctor in Virginia. And after Pearl Harbor, he recognized that his skills would be needed. So he enlisted in the Army. And unfortunately, he was on uh, one of the first waves on Omaha Beach, and he had lost his life. His son, Bob Jr., had donated his collection. His collection consists of letters back and forth to his mother consists of photographs, also consists of Father's Day cards that never made it. Bob Jr. never had an opportunity to know his father, but because of Veterans History Project, he was able to share the little bit that he knew about his father because it was featured over at the Capitol Visitor Center with all of the visitors who came in to view that collection. Now, lastly, I just want to talk about the fact that Veterans History Project is a tremendous way to honor the veterans within your life. Now, I don't know about you, but it's not every day somebody comes to me and asks for me to sit down for 30 minutes and tell my life story. In doing so, you connect with an individual in a completely different way. Is anyone familiar with the uh, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kettle story? Man, I'm telling you so many stories today. Um, Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kettles was a UH-1D Huey helicopter pilot during Vietnam. And he had noticed that there was a unit that had been ambushed, and he volunteered to go in and recover them as best as he could. In fact, he was ordered to stand down at a certain point, but he went back three times. Now, Charles Kettles is, once again, one of those veterans who said, oh, I don't know. I mean, I've shared my story before. Well, Charles Kettles sat down with his interviewer, an Ypsilanti, and the interviewer could not believe his ears. I, what do you mean you went back three times? How many men did you save? Oh, I don't know, maybe 40. So the interviewer took it upon himself to talk to some of those individuals who he had helped save. He reached out to them 
And everyone that he could get a hold of said, I would not be here today if it was not for Lieutenant Colonel Charles Kettles. So those interviews paired with some congressional support led to the photo that you see down here in the corner. 50 years after the fact, Charles Kettles finally received our nation's highest award, the Medal of Honor. And while this is the exception, um, it really does highlight the fact of what people do when they collect these stories. So at this point, I would like to ask if we have any questions, and with the questions, if everybody could choose to come up to the microphone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. In 1987, my family lost our, matri our patriarch, and he planned Operation Torch. He had tape upon tape upon tape, cassette tapes, that he submitted or requested that the executor turn over to the Library of Congress. That person did so before the family could hear the stories. How do I find them? Been looking for years. So two things. Number one, we will definitely talk afterwards. Okay. <laughs> Number two, Excuse me. you brought up a, a, really good, a really good point. Our website, which Of course, is the very last one I hit. Our website is loc.gov backslash vets. I would suggest that's the first point to try to look and see if we can find anything. The next place would be just the general library archive, and we can look on that together. Thirdly, I want to talk a little bit about a resolution that passed in November 2016. It's called the Gold Star Family Voices Act. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, Gold Star families are individuals who had lost a loved one during a time of war. You can, fi you can find them when you go to the World War II Memorial and the Gold Star Wall. Mm -hmm. We found our Gold Star, my grandfather's brother, but we can't find my grandfather's stories. So we, um, just to share, we, we have always uh, accepted posthumous submissions. However, in the instance of our Gold Star families, we now have an opportunity to ask them to be the mouthpiece for their fallen hero. We do have some separate guidelines and separate questions that are very specific to you. Um, and so we will talk afterwards so that we can record your perspective and you can share who your father was. Thanks. So with so many veteran organizations that are out there and the VA um, system, I'm, I'm a vet myself, having retired from the Navy, and going to the VA, you see the um, guys sitting there waiting for their medications, to, the prescriptions to be filled. Has this been a resource that we've looked at trying to use to get people to do the um, Veterans History Program Project? Absolutely. Um, basically, any which way that we can we, we always suggest things like that. Um, I had mentioned some of the individuals and organizations that we had worked with, and in fact, again, back down in Hall B at our table, um, there was a young lady who came up. She was about 18 years old, and she said, I'd really like to participate, but the only veteran I knew has passed away. Guess where we told her she could go for a resource? Um, the other thing that we do have is I would absolutely encourage everybody to take a peek at our website because every so often, we're not the right repository. Um, you may have noticed I didn't mention uniforms or medals. We, don't, we, we can't accept that. However, we have a lot of really great partner organizations that are alternate repositories that are listed right there on the website. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, you may have already answered this question, but do you take in stories for um, vets who are deceased? Yes, we do. We do. Um, so there are a number of different ways that somebody could submit a collection. In the case of posthumous submissions, I had mentioned that we have uh, collections ranging from World War I up through current conflicts, and believe it or not, we still occasionally will get World War I collections. Uh, one that we got just last November was a Gold Star daughter, and she had shared some letters that her father had written. With that, the, the letters were back and forth between family members, but included in that was a letter from the Red Cross. And it talked about where her father was buried and what flowers were planted near it. 
This was really important for her. She's 92 years old now, and she's the last in her line. And she wanted to make sure that this would be properly preserved so that somebody would be out there to have this resource and to appreciate her father the way she did. Thank you. Hi. 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 Um, I really appreciate your organization and this presentation. It's been great. I work at an elementary school and a middle school, and I'm just wondering if you ever receive interviews that younger children have done, or if you have specific questions for them. If not, if you have any recommendations about involving students in your organization in any way. So we do typically ask if somebody is going to be sitting down and conducting an interview with a veteran. Um, one of the things that we talk about when we do those big workshops, they're typically about two and a half hours long. I wa wanted to give you guys the Reader's Digest version, if you will. Um, but we talk about what would be appropriate questions to ask and what are inappropriate questions to ask. We do have those draft questions, but they are just a template. They are not a checklist, and so we want for people to ask follow-up questions. Sometimes the best question to ask is what happened next. Um, as far as children younger, we have been working with our education division to develop things that would be more pertinent to them, but I would be more than happy to share my uh, colleague over in the education division's name, and we can talk about things that would be more appropriate for kids of that age. Thank you. Thank you. I have my, a copy of my, great, of my grandfather's World War I journal that he wrote. The original is with my cousin, who may or may not be willing to share it. Can I submit the copy that I have? I made a Xerox from his original journal. I wish I could say yes. Um, the challenge with that is because of our lovely conservation and preservation division, we're also held to those standards. So it's a bit of a double-edged sword for us. Because we have the um, preservation division to help make sure all of those things are properly cared for, as I had mentioned with the uh, Albert John Carpenter diary where we use the Japanese tissue paper, that whole thing, um, we're also held to those standards. So when it comes to copies, it's really hard for us to keep those standards where they are. That being said, there are things that we can do we do have some rules in place, but I'm sure that we can talk about a way that maybe it could be properly cared for. Um, the other thing with our preservation and conservation office is I would strongly suggest that your relative who owns the original, take a look at their website, the preservation and conservation website, because it talks about ways to care for things like that. You know, the fibers and paper have changed a lot over the years, and we want to make sure that it does stand the test of time. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. I was wondering if you're ever in contact with other universities that may require projects like this. So for instance, uh, the University of, Na of Maine about 18 years ago required me for um, a class to record a 30-minute interview with my father about his experience in Vietnam. That interview was done on like all like old-time audio mm -hmm. tapes, so I only have one. And, and they have it. They, they took my only copy of it for a project. So I was wondering if Library of Congress ever reaches out to other universities to see if they have veteran stories within their own and then maybe could work together to yeah, get a Yeah, absolutely. Of yeah. Um, so to answer your question, yes, <laughs> is the short answer. Um, we work with a number of different organizations, and we have found that this is a wonderful project for colleges and community colleges to participate in, um, as well as Boy Scouts and um, high school students. So yes, we do. Um, I may be interested to find out more from you to see if that's one that we have currently in our archive. Anybody who is curious if an organization or individual has already participated, we can always take a peek on the website. Once again, loc.gov backslash vets. We have a really great search bar and you can search not just the veteran who had participated, the person who interviewed, you could search the state you could see how many different veterans had interviewed in that state. You could even see uh, organizational affiliations. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, this is a really exciting uh, program you're running. I'm just curious, you have, are there any opportunities for volunteers to work on the program here in DC? Absolutely, so I love that you ask that because Honestly, our program is based on volunteers. And what we're asking for you to do is to take, uh, take the veteran in your life or community and to use something as simple as your cell phone. Or you could use a tablet. 
but you can sit down with them and you can review the field kit that we have, and then you can ask those specific questions. So absolutely. Thanks. Thank you. Maybe one more? No. Anyone else? Going once. Yes. I'm sorry, I missed it. Yes, yes, we have other information and people over at the table. Again, Halby, we're in the Jefferson area. We have a bright purple uh, tablecloth because purple is the colors of all the service units combined, so it'll be easy enough to find us. Well, at this point, I just want to thank you all for coming and choosing to be here today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the National Book Festival. Thanks.